We're continuing in our Gavaliga Sugya of Emuna. It's been a while since we gave the last Sheh, but we've got quite a bit to uh, still continue to do. Uh, today's Sheh, and actually the rest of the series, is very kindly sponsored. Refushleim Eli Sheba Bas Sora. A Gyoris full of Emuna, full of Betochen, very positive in the middle of her sickness. And Be'ez Hashem, the Schos of the Torah from this Sheh, should be a tremendous Refur Shalema for her. B'Soich Sha Cholei Yisrael. Thank you for that tremendous uh, opportunity and for partnering with us, Be'ez Hashem. Let's continue. So I want to start today with an interesting idea uh, brought down in this forum of Reb Nossin, Reb Nossin being one of the Ikat Talmidim of Reb Nachman Breslov, and he says the following idea, which I think is a very interesting idea, which I would like to share with you, if that is okay. So, basically like this. The, there was a Rebbe, by the Rebbe, his name was the Rebbe of Tulchin, and he was a Talmud of Rebbe Nassim, of Breslov, who, as I said, was one of the Ikat Talmidim who wrote down the Torah of Reb Nachman. And he basically said to Reb Nossin that, you know, I feel bad that I didn't have the privilege of knowing Reb Nachman of Breslov personally. So Reb Nossin said to him in a, in a very stark way, he said, who has the audacity to say that they know Reb Nachman from Breslov? Yosef Frunik? Now, who is Yosef Frunik? Yosef Frunik was a simple guy, a yid, who operated a ferry on the river. Now, all day long, he would transfer people from one side of the river to the other side of the river, okay? Now, Reb Nachman of Breslov would often use Yosef Frunik's services all the time. So Yosef used to boast and he used to say, Oh, I spent a lot of time with Reb Nachman. I knew him very well. So Reb Nossin, Talmud of Reb Nachman, used to stress that the physical knowledge of someone or something is totally meaningless. Yosef Runik knew what Reb Nachman looked like, but he had no idea and hadn't had the faintest clue about Reb Nachman's incredible spiritual, ginormous personality and his stature. Right? To know Reb Nachman, explained Reb Nachman, you have to understand his teachings, you have to understand his Torah, you have to understand his panemius, not just what he looked like, right? And therefore, a Talmud according to that, explained Reb Nossin, can actually know a tzaddik in the next generation more than a contemporary acquaintance that saw him in flesh and blood. Yosef Frutnik not only saw Reb Nachman, but he even, he even touched him. He helped him on the ferry, he helped him off, whatever. Right? But physical proximity isn't generally nothing to do with spiritual awareness. And therefore, you know, he was a simple ferryman, which was very nice, but he was far removed from the tzaddik. He had no idea of Reb Nachman's holiness, his Chochmah, and of course his Torah as well. And explains Rav Nossam, and this is why I'm telling you this. Why am, why am I telling you this? He explains the same thing applies to the knowledge of the Rabboi Nishalodam. The Neshama in the higher world takes tremendous pleasure in the or in the light of the Rabboi Nishalodam, without knowing anything of Hashem. And it also resembles the ferryman who boasted he knew Rab Nachman when really he knew nothing more than the color of Nachman's beard. And therefore, what we have to realize when we talk about the Muna is it's, it's, what we're trying to do is almost get to know the Rabbi Nishalim, Kavi Yochel, if we could say the words. You know, when I was in America, uh, I had the schuss of meeting many, many people. And I met one particular Yid who is a Yid who literally lives with Hashem. I spoke to him for just a few minutes, but sometimes a few minute conversation can reveal to you that you know that that person, you know, you can, a lot about the person. This person I spoke to is a bala boss, I'm sure he learns, but he lives with the Rabbi Nishalayim. He push it, lives with Hashem. In other words, everything about his life was, there's a Rabbi Nishalayim, for example. I was telling him, you know, a bit about my plans of America, I'm trying to meet this one, I'm trying to meet that one, you know, I have to do my shtadlas. And he said to me, which is so true, and that you know, puts the whole trip into perspective, when I go on these fundraising, fundraising trips, ultimately the Rabboni Shalom runs the world. Rabboni Shalom's got enough money to support every yeshiva, every organization, every person in the world. But we have to do our shtadlis. We have to do our That's our obligation. In life, our obligation is to do our shtadlis. And Munin Hashem is the belief that the Rabboni Shalom can do everything. 
Yes, we sometimes, we're living in the physical world and therefore we have to do things in order for things to happen. We have to daven, we have to make a pranasa, we have to work, we have to do, you know, go to the store to buy things, it's not just going to come on our doorstep, it's not like the mon. We're living in a world where we have to do things, but ultimately to realize, to live with the Rabbani Shalom changes your life. Why? Because everything that happens to you, everything, whether it's good, whether it's bad, is the Rabbani Shalom. When you live with Hashem, when you practice emunah in your life, you will change your whole mindset and your perspective to there's a Rabbani Shalom. So let's say right now something's happening that I, I, it's just, I can't understand. Why did the Rabbani Shalom do this? There's a Rabbani Shalom. We, we don't understand everything. We don't always have the answers. And that's fine. We don't have to have the answers. Right? As we have said many times before, the Kava Yosha brings Modika Maisa. Listen to this Maisa. He brings a Maisa from the Ramban, one of the Rishonim. And the Ramban says as follows. He had a Talmud who was very, very sick. And this Talmud, it looked like he was going to go to the Olam MS. It looked like he was going to leave the world. And the Ramban used the opportunity. He sat with the Talmud. He said, listen, you're about to leave the world. Right? Normally you don't do that, but he, he, whatever, he understood that this is what he had to do. You're about to leave the world. I have questions of how the Rabbani Shalom runs the world. I don't understand. Why does Hashem do this? Why does Hashem do that? Why does this person suffer? Why does that person have a good life? What, what's Pshat? Which is ultimately Moshe Rabbeinu's question, right? Moshe Rabbeinu asked the question of the Rabbeinu, why do good people have a hard life? Why do you know, bad people have a good life? That's a famous question. The Chavis of has the parents. Okay. The Rabban said to him, listen, I have questions of how the Rabbeinu should run the world. And I would really like answers. Could you do me a favor? I'm going to give you a list of questions. And I'm going to give you the password to get to the highest place in Shemaim, right? There are seven levels. I'm going to give you a password to get to each one. You'll get to the Rabbeinu, we get to Kisar Kovit. Ask the Rabbeinu Shalom my questions and then come back to me in a dream and tell me. Okay? Kaba Yosha brings the Maisa. So he did it. He told him. The Talmud unfortunately left this world. And a couple of weeks later, whatever it was, the Talmud comes in a dream. And it says, you know, they always have Doma to give us, I'm not allowed to come back in a dream and whatever, but they let me because I told you that they would, and you're the Ramban, fine. But he said to him, Rebbe, I want you to explain something. You had questions of how the Rabban Shum runs the world. When I got to Shomayim, each level that I went higher and higher and higher, closer to the Kisar Kovod, more and more of those questions just fell away. They were no longer questions anymore. They, they weren't even Shailas. I, I, they didn't bother me. And that's something that we have to understand, but it's something that we have to practice, something we have to live with. If we have a Muna in Hashem, our lives become better lives. Our lives become much more calm lives. We've spoken about this before. right? It, it's a very, very important thing. If a person wants a relationship with the Rabbi Nishalolam, he has to have emunah and he has to have betochen. The Chazanish famously described emunah as the body of halachas pertaining to betochen. While betochen is the actual fulfillment of the halachas of emunah, if you understand what I'm saying. As we believe that the Rabbi Nishalolam created the world and continues to run all of creation. The Rabbi Nishalolam had the kayak to create the world from nothing. There was nothing here. And the Rabbanishim created the world. And he didn't just leave the world. He kept the world going and he continues every day, every moment. Even though there is no time in the Rabbanishim's world. But to our understanding and our limited physical brain. The Rabbanishim created the world and continues to run the world. How can it be that the Rabbanishim will do something that's not good? It cannot. Everything is good. We don't see it. We don't understand it. But you know what? Our limited brain doesn't allow us to. Because we're in a physical world. And therefore, we cannot fully understand it. But we have to believe that every Nisayan that comes our way, and we all get Nisayanis, that's life. Since the Shoram, we quoted this countless times. Everything's a Nisayan. People have this Nisayan, people have that Nisayan, people have different Nisayanis, different, different times of life, whatever it is. But we have to realize, in truth, it comes from the Rabbani Shalom. So if you live with the Mun, if you live that everything's Hashem, whatever happens to be good, bad, more, yes, whatever it is, it's the Rabbani Shalom. Parnas is yes working out, Parnas is not working out. All of these things. A yid has to live with emunah. Tzaddik be'emunosoy yechyeh. A tzaddik lives with emunah. You can't live without emunah and you can't be a tzaddik without emunah. Because the only way to attain such a level is by having an emunah. Emunah means to a deep understanding and a deep relationship and a deep knowledge that there's a Rabbani Shalom. And whatever happens is the Rabbani Shem. And there's Ashkacha protests in the world. And whatever happens to me, it's because Hashem wanted it to happen. And there's a Rabbani Shem. And Kodot Ovid, Rahman, and the Tab Ovid. Everything Hashem does is good. But we have to live this. 
And this is the knowledge that we have to live with. This is something that we have to work on every day. Every single day. There should be a day that goes by that we don't think about this. And we should think about this because we have to machadik ourselves. And even if life is going good, say thank you, Rabbi Yisrael, that it's going good. But the more you work on this, if chas v'shalom, something doesn't go good, then can you imagine what your life is? You have people that are happy in every situation they're in. And you wonder how. You have people that experience the terrible tzoros. People that buried their own children. We, we, we cannot even contemplate such a terrible thing. To bury your own child. We should never know of such things. But there are people out there that have done this. And these people got up. Like for example, just to give you one small example. The number of years ago you remember the terrible story of Leib Kletsky in America. I think it was from Borough Park, right? And, and the, the, the death that he, that he came to. How did his father get up? By the Leviah, I don't know how old he was. He was eight years old, does that make sense? Mm-hmm. About eight years old. His father got up by the Leviah and said, I want to thank the Rabbi Nishan for the eight years that the Rabbi Nishan gave me with my son. Do, do you know what that means? You're thanking the Rabbi Nishan He wasn't joking. He, he meant it. I want to thank the Rabbi Nishan for the eight years that you gave me with my son. That's a level of Amunah. How did he get that? Just woke up one day with that Amunah? Absolutely not. He worked on it, and he worked on it, and he worked on it, and he instilled it within him. That's what we need to do. That's our job. If we want to get someone in Munah, we need to do this. We need to live this every day. It's to permeate within our blood and our veins, in our bodies, because then we can cope with everything in life, and everything is good, and everything is fine. I'm not saying be oblivious to the world and do whatever it is, because Hashem runs the world, so we do whatever it is. No, of course not. A person has to work hard. A person has to try. A person has to do A person has to daven. A person has to talk to Hashem. But the first step... Believe there's a Rabbi Nishalaylam. He created the world. He's running the world constantly. Every single moment of our lives. He's looking at us like that dear son. The Rabbi Nishalaylam loves us more than your father can ever love you. And I'm sure your father loves you very, very much. But the Rabbi Nishalaylam loves you much more. Much more. You can't even understand it. You think he wants something bad from you? He wants the best. He loves you. If the Rabbi Nishalaylam loves you more than your father can ever love you, he only wants the best. Does he give you an assign sometimes? Yeah, because you need it. Or whatever it may be. Rabbi Sain, the Chovetz Chaim, and we'll end with this. The Ali Chovetz Chaim says that at the end of time, right before Mashiach comes, the Rabbi Nishalonim will stretch a rope from one end of the world to the other end and shake it vigorously. Anyone who holds on tightly will survive. Those who let go will not. These are the times that we're living in right now. The times of shakeable emuna that we have to hold on tight. There's a wind blowing very, very, very strong right now. But if we hold on and we tightly grab hold on to that rope of Amunah and that anchor of Amunah and faith in the Rabbi Nishalaylam, it can literally change our lives. Okay, we'll continue tomorrow.